antiarrhythmics. So um, you know, it, I, I typically find students don't remember too well the past when they discuss heart electrophysiology, but I assume you guys have been over like SA node and AV node a little bit anyway. I'm going to review that some, but um, these are the targets of antiarrhythmics. Okay, Goodman and Gilman, chapter 29 is the reading for that. Um, and this stuff is complicated, like a lot of this stuff in, in this semester. We've got complicated and maybe a little bit on the dry side, but it's going to require some studying for you guys to understand antiarrhythmics. Okay? Um, more studying than, for instance, beta block. Okay, um, so briefly, um, an overview of how things work normally. Uh, cardiac cells are going to depolarize and repolarize about 60 times per minute. Of course, I'm standing up here now. Mine's probably going about 100 times per minute. Means my heart rate is probably going about 100 times per minute, right? Um, action potential and uh, size and duration uh, get determined by cell membrane ion channel activity. So essentially, heart, you've got these um, like basically electrical cells in the heart. They work a lot like neurons work because they are a lot like neurons. You can even consider them neurons. Okay? And so these guys have action potentials a lot like a neuron has action potentials, uh, albeit with, with a, little, a little bit of difference here. Okay, um, so when these things are functioning normally, and, and everyone's fine, but um, their uh, normal cardiac cell electrophysiology can be disrupted and can lead to arrhythmias. So you guys know arrhythmias, the heart is not beating like it normally should, right? Not a nice steady rate like it should. Um, so, so some of the ways that uh, normal cardiac electrophysiology can be screwed up would be by myocardial ischemia, so with myocardial ischemia, not enough blood, not enough oxygen supply really to the heart, right? And you can get tissue damage with that. You get tissue damage in the heart. Among other things, what that's going to do is it's going to disrupt normal signaling um, of the heart, and so the heart rate, it's, or you know, the normal beating of the heart is going to be messed up that way because you got tissue damage that's blocking the spread of the, the normal spread of the signal or the generation of the signal. Uh, sympathetic stimulation can also disrupt normal heart function, so increase sympathetic nervous system out, um, activity or, or inconsistent sympathetic nervous system activity can be an issue in terms of um, heart cell function. Uh, and then uh, myocardial scarring, if for, for whatever reason somebody's got um, tissue damage at the level of the heart, you know, scarring, etc. That, that will disrupt the normal spread of the electrical signal throughout the heart and disrupt normal heart beating. Okay, um, so in, in general, or this overview here really, um, arrhythmias can range from incidental and asymptomatic uh, to life-threatening. So, you know, sometimes somebody will go to the doctor or whatever and they'll pick up a, you know, a, you know um, to drop heartbeat or you know whatever um, and a lot of times it's not a big deal um, but and again sometimes it is um, so the mechanisms that underlie these these arrhythmias are not always known um, so and this is it's complicated treating arrhythmias uh, and pharmacotherapy is often decided ba based on what worked in the past so I've got a guy who's you know got heart flutter or some such thing and he seems like another guy I had, and so I'll use the same drug that was successful. So it's not it's not as an exact of a science to to you know give these people the right drug as you would hope for. Okay, the, the two main goals of, of antiarrhythmic therapy are to stop an ongoing arrhythmia, and and you know if you, if you can you know kind of the gold standard would be to prevent arrhythmias overall. Okay. Um, so, and how antiarrhythmic drugs work is they suppress arrhythmias by altering either ion channel activity or autonomic parameters that regulate heart function. Uh, a really big thing, I mean, and, and there will be a question, and, and presum presumably there will be a question on the test, and it won't be about bubbles or buttercup or blossom. 
but there will be a question on the test and it'll be simple and everybody will get it right because one of the biggest problems with antiarrhythmic agents is you're messing with ion channel activity, et cetera, at these very vital cells in the heart and they, they can cause arrhythmias as well as help them, okay? So, you know, if somebody's got a serious arrhythmia issue, they've got a serious issue because the drugs, you know, people are taking can, can cause problems too. Um, okay, um, and, and agents, usually the agents that get used usually affect more than one ion channel current. Uh, so again, you can have beneficial effects with antiarrhythmic agents and you can cause unwanted effects as well. Okay, so just a little bit about uh, electrophysiology at the level of the heart. I'm not going to go over that particular slide, but we'll start here. Um, the, the normal um, cardiac membrane uh, resting potential, so these are the electrical cells governing the heart, um, heart rate, et cetera, heart contraction. <laughs> Uh, those cells have a, a um, resting potential of about mi minus 80 to minus 90 millivolts inside versus outside. So if you want to think back to neuron electrophysiology, right? Remember what your average neuron's resting potential is? It's about minus 65 millivolts inside versus outside. And all that is is a measure of, you know, you take an electrode put it inside the cell and an electrode outside the cell, and it's the difference between those two, right? So um, with, with a neuron, it's about minus 60 or so, minus 65. With these cardiac cells, it's minus 80 to minus 90. So they're, they're depolarized or hyperpolarized more? Hyper. Uh, hyperpolarized, right. Okay, um, and so what happens uh, under normal circumstances, of course, the resting potential, like in neurons, gets maintained by ion pumps and, and especially a sodium potassium <laughs> pump. Okay, you guys remember sodium potassium pumps? They exchange, um, what was it, three sodium for two potassium? Mm -hmm. Or did I get that backwards? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So you kick out three sodium, bring in two potassium. I'm getting old and I can't, can't miss, uh, remember what I'm about to say. So. Okay, so the sodium potassium pumps, um, most targets have watched, you know, different sodium potassium pumps, targets have lots of different drugs. Um, okay, so, so they're, they're involved in, in maintaining the resting potential, also in, in repolarizing the cell. So what happens is um, voltage-gated sodium channels are closed when a cardiac cell is at rest. And this, they, these work a lot, you know, like neuron electrophysiology. Um, and so also when a neuron is at rest, you'll get some leakiness for potassium. So potassium channels are open. And if you remember, potassium leakiness, or potassium um, electrophysiological parameters are really what help mainly set the, these um, membrane potentials. Okay, so at, at rest, you'll, you'll have some of these potassium channels are open to leakiness to potassium, and then the, the resting potential gets largely determined by that potassium. Uh, as you remember, um, once threshold gets reached, so and, and the heart and the SA node cells of the heart, is, they spontaneously fire. So that means they spontaneously depolarize the threshold and have an action potential. Um, and once that happens, you got voltage gated sodium channels open. Uh, that allows sodium to come rushing into the cell. So you get this rapid depolarization. So you have an action potential. Um, then what happens, you reach a certain point, a plateau. Um, sodium channels are then going to be inactivated and closed, and then the cell is going to return to its resting potential, uh, and that's largely driven by sodium and potassium pumps. Um, and I have a picture of this in a second that I think explains it better than just words do. But um, so uh, this transmembrane changes uh, caused by the sodium influx is going to, among other things, alter the opening or closing of other ion channels. Um, and one of those ion channels is going to be a repolarizing potassium channel that's going to open and then later inactivate once, once the cell has come back closer to its resting potential. Um, and then uh, I'm going to actually skip the words here and go to the picture. 
But one, one point is mutations in genes for various ion channels can cause congenital heart dysfunction. So bigger picture point, if somebody's got um, abnormal ion channel activity um, at the level of the heart, they, you know, they probably have a heart issue. There's no guy who did study these things, sodium channels, he called them channelopathies, uh, which I don't think is a term that actually gets used. So. Okay, so as I said, I think this stuff is better described by a picture than a, than a bunch of words on a slide. So this slide shows action potential at a heart cell, and you can see already it's different than action potential like as a, at a neuron in the brain. So down here we've got the resting potential, which again, this, this slide has it at minus 96 millivolts. Okay, so there's some, you know, big bigger point that's much lower than um, a neuron would be. So what happens is when, when these cells are, have an action potential, okay, they you get this rapid depolarization. That rapid <coughs> depolarization for this action potential is characterized by sodium rushing into the cell. So sodium passing through the membrane. And that's because you have these voltage-gated sodium channels that are open once once the cell is reached, once the membrane potential reaches threshold, get these sodium channels open. Okay, this is gonna peak out, and what happens is you're gonna get this little notch-like activity. So you've got here's where the peak of the action potential is, and it's you know roughly plus 50 millivolts. Okay. And, and once you get that peak, and this is the one place where heart cells are a little different than neurons per se, is you get this um, opening of potassium and chloride channels, a net effect of which is to cause some repolarization, but it's not a lot of repolarization. So you've got these channels open, and you get this minor um, repolarization, but, and then you get what's called a plateau, okay? so. It's going to, the, the electrophysiology from the membrane potential is going to hold for a second or 200 milliseconds, right, roughly. Okay, so, so and, and at, this, at this plateau, you've got other ion channels that are going to open, um, including a calcium channel and a potassium channel. Calcium is going to come in, potassium is going to go out. The net effect is you get this kind of holding pattern. In, in the membrane potential, before you get to the repolarate, repolarization phase, where the main thing going on is you've got a potassium channel that's open, that's allow, allowing potassium to go out. You've also got that sodium potassium pump, and that's not on the slide, that, that's working um, over time, right, to get the cell back to its resting potential, uh, which is down here, okay, so back to the resting potential. So you want to know the basics of how heart muscles, or how these cardiac action potentials occur, okay? Very similar to neurons, but you know, there, there are some differences you want to be aware of. And you're, you're free to study therapeutics again, if you haven't already. So that's it for today. I'm going to finish this uh, arrhythmia stuff on Wednesday, as well as do a, a, uh, a quiz on renin-angiotensile system and diuretics. Okay, those are the two big things.